The Digital Photography Cafe show is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera, and by Shootproof, the easy way to proof and sell your photos online. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe show. Join hosts Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina as they chat about the art and business of photography. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is episode 110. I'm Joseph Christina here with my co-host Trevor Curran. On last week's episode, we talked about a brand new mail app for your Mac, Adobe's Lightroom 5, and discussed Apple's WWDC event. If you haven't watched last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it at our website, digitalphotographycafe.com, in iTunes, listen with the popular Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox music apps, or watch in HD on TiVo. So, Joe, we're back. How you doing? How are you doing, my friend? I am doing well. Excellent. We have a big show today, right? A lot of data, a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, a lot of announcements this week, a lot of interesting things going on. So uh, we right. should probably get right into it. Let's jump right in. Feet first, That's or maybe right. even head first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. So back into the cloud with us, right? Back yep. into the cloud. More Adobe Creative Cloud discussions. Right. Yeah. A lot, I'd say a lot of um, blog um, entries, let's say. A lot of blogs are kind of blowing up with the cloud. And it just, it, it doesn't look good for Adobe right now at all. And, you know, our friend over there, Trey Radcliffe, um, he had, uh, you know, one of his articles. This was, I think, this week, a couple of days ago. Uh just kind of, I don't know, I would say tearing it up a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. The, the name of the, the title of the article is Not Impressed by Adobe Creatives Cloud's Launch Features for Photographers. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah like, he's, he's not a real fan of, of Creative Cloud. He definitely, the overall gist of the article, he definitely feels that, you know, they're, the only reason they're doing the cloud is for their own best interest, not necessarily for that of the photographer or the creative. And right. uh, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, he, we've got a couple quotes here from his article and he says, uh, Adobe should not release such lame updates to Photoshop and Lightroom to convince people that the cloud subscription software is exciting. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, no, this is true. I mean, you know, that's kind of like what we commented when when we first talked about it. I think it was like three weeks ago or something like that. It's just lackluster. I yeah. mean, at best. And, you know, now we have everything will be CC, you know, Photoshop CC, Illustrator CC, you know, yep. Yep. Um, probably doing away with all the numbering altogether because it'll continuously be updated if you're on the CC, you know. So, yeah. um yeah. You know, they should have just said, listen, you're going to subscribe to the Creative Cloud or we're no longer going to support you know, your, your software. You know, you do not have a choice. Um, but instead, yeah, just like, you know, Trey was saying, they, they came up with all of these great reasons, you know, like right. this new sharpening thing or this new, you know, this stupid stuff to try to bring people into the cloud. It's like, oh, my God, really? Yeah. I mean, come. Yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly right. He said, uh, you know, the top bullet point for Lightroom was include videos in your slideshows. Yeah, are you serious? And he's like, he's <laughs> like, really? That was on the top of the list, the features that most photographers wanted. You know, he, yeah, he, uh, he's, he really kind of bashed. You know, just like bit. we were saying before, you know, once they do this, and we know that they're, they are a monopoly when it comes to, um, you know, editing, photo editing, video, you know, right now they're pretty much the main out there, the main guys, the big, you know, gorilla. And the problem with this is, is once again, like we said, is they are able to iterate and not innovate. And that's a sad thing because that means that we are being affected by not getting really new, great um, features. We're just getting iteration of what has already been done for the last 10 years. And, um, you know, more of the same is not good. We say that all the time yeah. with our photography, with our business, with everything that we do. More of the same is not what people are looking for. They're looking for innovation. And I just don't see it in, in Adobe right now at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, and from a business standpoint, he says, uh, if cloud-based subscriptions really are so awesome for Photoshop, why do they have a completely different business model for Lightroom? Right. Uh, they, so they're trying to say that Lightroom is not a professional um, grade product is what they're saying. Yeah, and, they're saying you know, that Photoshop, it's for hobbyists right. and casual people and Photoshop is more for professionals. Which is so ridiculous on like, 
just it's nuts. It's yeah. just completely ridiculous because, you know, most of the pros at this point have converted, you know, let's say if they're on the Mac, then they're using Aperture, they're using, you know, something to go and catalog their photos. They've already moved into Lightroom um, because it just, it works well. And right. since they're probably already using Photoshop, you know, using Lightroom and Photoshop together that, you know, it just works and it works it seamlessly, quote unquote, right? really thick, right. bold quotes on that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, to say that, you know, that if this is a hobbyist, you know, more of a hobbyist, uh, or, you know, a non pro is for Lightroom and the rest is pro is just, is makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely. Yeah. No I mean, sense. you're going to have beginners and hobbyists that use Lightroom, of course. I mean, you're also going to have beginners and hobbyists that use Photoshop elements or what have you, but you know, really what this cloud thing is going to do. Um, and he says this in, in his article is that, you know, it's the same price no matter what your skill level is. So yeah. whether you're a beginner or you're a professional, you're paying the same monthly price. And that is going to create a financial barrier to entry for the beginners who don't really right. want to drop $30 a month to have access to you know the whole suite of apps or even $20 a month for a single app. Yeah. You're you know, gonna have if, the, if the haves and the have nots, right? It's yeah. like feudal times, the haves and have nots and that's it, no middle ground. And yes, I mean, the way if you want to do a creative cloud and you want to me, you want to do it better right. or what I would think would be properly is, yes, you'd have a professional, you'd have an intermediate and then you have like the, the hobbyist and you'd have different grades and different prices. And then when what you would do is instead of just giving everything to everyone that subscribes to creative cloud, you kind of limit it because sure. I tell you what, the hobbyist does not want to see even closely anything that resembles illustrator for the most part no. or you know any of the high end or or just for example premiere i mean most people you know that are hobbyists aren't going to try to spend you know months learning yeah. premiere to do video they're just going to use something on their mac or on their pc just yeah. to throw something together so yeah it, it's just uh, to me i think it's segregating and you know like you were saying you know having it the way it is right now is going to I think what will happen is, is the hobbyists are not going to be using Photoshop and they're going to look for alternatives because they just yep. can't afford that continuous cost. Or what they'll do is they'll try it for a while and they're going to see this real massive slope where right now this big massive buildup of people that are jumping into the cloud um, that don't subscribe for a year. And after three or four months, that thing just just plummets. Right. Um, what is probably what will end up happening. And then they're probably going to end up having to rethink this, and especially when you start seeing a lot of the larger guys, a lot of the, you know, the big programming out there, you know, like we did, we came out there right from the get go and said, listen, yeah. this is a problem. This is why it's a problem. And you even did a beautiful job at running down the pricing and breaking it all down. So if you guys haven't listened to, I think it was like two or three episodes ago, yeah. you know, do that and you'll see the actual pricing of this, not what you think it is, but what it really is and what it comes down to over a year, over two years, over three years and this type of thing. And you have an idea really quickly that this does, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for anyone that's not a professional or that is in the industry and is trying to keep up to date on a regular basis because they need to be compatible with everyone out there. So right. Yeah, right. it's exactly. it's a major issue, and I I love that you know that Trey ended up you know writing something. There's been a lot out there, but we're kind of highlighting his. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of negativity right now, and a lot of negative buzz in the photo community as well yeah. as the creative, the whole creative community on this um, creative cloud. You know, yeah, that's of. right, that's right. Yeah. But I mean, on on kind of a a positive side with um, creative cloud, um, one of our uh, PR contacts got a hold of us this week and sent us some information about uh, one of their clients called Cyber Systems, and they make a product called GoodSync. Very cool, yeah. Yeah, GoodSync is a backup and synchronization software that you can run on your Mac or PC and you know even your, uh, your mobile devices and stuff. They have different versions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really neat software, but what's interesting about it is Adobe actually is using their product to synchronize your creative cloud storage, right? which is interesting. It, it'll sync it between your desktops, your laptops, um, and again, your mobile devices. So right. that's kind of cool. I mean, you know. It's like always, Dropbox for. It's know. kind of like a it's combination kind of, yeah. of a shared Dropbox that does synchronization on your on all your computers, wherever you have you know the Dropbox app installed. 
um, as well as kind of a time machine or another form of a backup right. software, kind of all in one. Right. So it, yeah, it is interesting, but you're not using the cloud to do it. You're using your own software. The software basically is calling home saying, okay, back this up, sync it over to this computer. And then the, the pieces of software are communicating together to actually make this transfer and backup happen. So yeah, right. it's really cool. Um, I like it. I think yeah. it's a pretty neat idea of software and it's kind of interesting that Adobe is actually using it in their new system. So, right, right, right. Yeah. And whatever you have any type of backing up that ends up, you know, in the cloud, it's, it's good. It's, it's a good idea. No matter what we always want to do that, you know, three step backup, you want to have, you know, one local, one off site, one, one air quote yep. unquote, um, you know, one in the cloud. So, um, anyways, you know, we talked about three weeks ago and, you know, back with the Adobe product, we were, we were speculating that, you know, maybe um, it has to do with pirating because we know that Photoshop or Adobe products is the number one pirated software out there. And we're like, well, maybe yep. they're trying to, you know, rein this in somehow and reduce the amount of pirating. And, you know, you know, being in the computer industry for so long, you know, my, my thing was, I just immediately said, this is just not going to work. Um, this yeah, we actually be, discussed this on a previous we, show too. Yeah, we talked about that. There's absolutely no way to do it. They're just going to shut down the internet internally, not have anything feed out and just force feed it with um, authentication. And um, the funny thing is, is uh, we just found an article and sure enough, the day after CC came out, yep, it was a torrent. It was, it was pirated and um, it works absolutely flawlessly is what yep. they're saying. And, you know, you're talking about tens of thousands of people that are offering this creative cloud, the seed for it um, throughout the world. Um, so, yeah, uh, if for some reason Adobe had any thought that this was going to somehow prevent piracy, th just like I said in that in the previous show, it, they're sadly mistaken. And yeah. they were extremely sadly mistaken because it took one day for the creative cloud to be pirated and now it's like all over the place. The, you know, just as a side note to that, you know, we brought up, uh, I found a list of uh, pirated software and like the number two pirated software was <laughs> um, Photoshop CS5. So I thought that was really, really amazing. And then under that, of course, you have Illustrator and um, Adobe's um, After Effects and of course some of the Windows stuff like Office and Word. But it just goes to show that yes, obviously there is a big, you know, there's a big draw to Adobe's product. Okay. We know that, but I think what they're doing to let's say capital capitalize on where they stand right now by making people subscribe is going to bite them for sure. Um, yeah. and the piracy is just increased. It, it didn't, it didn't get any less. Matter of yeah. fact, it was even quicker because, you know, like they were saying um, in one of the articles I was reading, you know, most of these hard, you know, hardware based products where you're getting, you know, four DVDs or something and they're uploading all it, you know, was was even more difficult. You know, it took longer. So instead of one day <laughs> to to uh, to pirate, you know, maybe it took them a week. You know, now it's like it's in a moment and yeah. it's already up. Online. Well, where there's a will, there's a way. Right. I mean, Absolutely. There, it's. It's popular enough, and this was enough of a challenge for these hackers to try and figure it out. And obviously, they figured it out very quickly. And, uh, you know, I mean, so how is this going to affect Adobe? I mean, will they care um, that this pirated software is out there? Because, again, I mean, this pirated software has been out there for a very long time. I mean, this oh, yeah. isn't something new. And, you know, but yet they still seem to sell the software. And I think what happens is... I think maybe even in the back of their mind, they're thinking that, well, you know what? Our software is getting out there. We don't like it. We don't approve right. of it. But the fact is our software is getting out there. And if enough, let's say, honest people <laughs> that right, are using right. our pirated software enjoy it enough, then eventually yeah. they may go and buy it. Right. And then once they buy it, you know, because they don't want to run pirated software, they want to make sure all the functionality is there or whatever their reasons are, you know, sure. they may go and buy it. You know, obviously yeah, so, for legal but, reasons, you know, you got to. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what ends up happening with this whole, you know, yep. Adobe thing, because, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to talk about it, you know, on every show. But what happens is, is it's so, you know, right now it's such a hot topic that, you know, we're continuously being bombarded with um, articles and things that are going on about this because 
uh, you know, the the bottom line is, is people are in an uproar and um, rightfully so, I think. Yep. So anyways, bef- yeah. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a quick break to hear from a couple of our sponsors. Are you frustrated with slightly out of focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer, and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. As photographers, we're always trying to increase sales and profits after every event. We shoot an event and have hundreds or even thousands of images that just sit on our hard drives. Perhaps a better workflow would increase sales by getting those valuable images in front of the client. That's where ShootProof comes in. At ShootProof.com, you can have an online gallery for all of your clients' proofing needs. ShootProof helps increase profits while building your brand and securing your photos without charging commission fees on sales. ShootProof galleries display your photos beautifully while helping to streamline your workflow and automate more of your business through their intuitive studio control panel. Once approved, photos can be directly fulfilled through ShootProof's various professional lab partners or fulfilled by you. All ShootProof plans have the same feature set. You simply choose the number of client photos stored, decide what products to sell, and the price. Try ShootProof today by taking advantage of their free 30-day trial offer. As a Digital Photography Cafe viewer, ShootProof is offering a 20% discount off any of their premium plans by using promo code DPC20 at checkout. ShootProof. Upload, share, sell, print. Okay, so we're back. So, you know, on the last few shows in kind of in light of Adobe's creative cloud and uh, people, the uproar of it, we've kind of been talking about alternatives to Photoshop and Lightroom and and such. And uh, I know we've mentioned uh, GIMP in the past as a Photoshop alternative. And Joe, I know you've been playing with GIMP a little bit, just checking it out, seeing what it what it's all about. And uh, you've kind of been working on a little project lately that you wanted to share with everyone. So why don't you uh, tell us right. a little bit about it? You know? So, you know, Trev, um, you know, I do, I, I always like me uh, Angelina, right? Yeah. So, you like Angelina, um, yes. Absolutely. Right. So, um, you know, I decided I, I, you know, I wanted to do just a quick painting. And what I wanted to do is instead of using the Photoshop, like I'm always using, um, I was going to go ahead and use GIMP, but I was going to limit myself as much as possible. And, and the idea here was, you know, what can we do at, you know, an absolute, you know, on an absolute shoestring budget. Yep. So what I did is I took GIMP. Um, 2.8, the latest version, 2.84, which I think is it free is. software. It's absolutely free. Yep. And I installed it on my MacBook Air um, to make it, you know, so it's 13 inch. It's not the big i7, 27 inch that we have here in the studio um, for, for most um, operations. So I installed that. I went ahead and took my kids' um, uh, Bamboo, which is a Wacom tablet, but it's the entry level um version right with like no buttons on it no eraser no nothing it's yep. not the intuit you know the intuits that we have um here in the studio um so you know it's the absolute basic tablet and i said well i'm gonna go ahead and just paint just start drawing so i didn't do any tracing i didn't do any grid work i just started sketching and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna show some of these pictures here so what my i limited myself as much as possible I used one brush instead of multiple brushes just to keep it absolutely simple. And I used GIMP for this. So I started out with just a quick line drawing from the reference material. Um, try to get proportions kind of as best as possible. And then I got a little bit more detailed, start working on some eyes, finally started putting in some darks, just like if I was doing a painting, you yep. know, um, back in the day. 
And then finally we started working on some skin and then finally dropped in the hair. Um, and then, you know, threw in a background and kind of called it a day. I think it came out pretty good. Um, of yeah, course, you good. always, you know, always can do better when it comes to any kind of painting. And, yeah. you know, and for me, hard. <laughs> I'm anal retentive. So I would be in here for absolutely forever because, you know, I'm touching stuff continuously. And that's yeah. just my that's just the way I work. But the whole idea here was to do it quick. I was working like 15 minutes at a time, you know, in the dark at, in my house. <laughs> you know, what I mean, when right. the kids fell asleep just to kind of, you know, play around. And um, this is what I came up with, just playing around. So, um, you know, it's the idea here is not that you have to go and spend a lot of money uh, to create. Right. Because the, the point of the matter is you don't. There's many programs out there, and we've discussed some, and we'll probably put some more in future shows, that um, allow you to create but at a low cost. And sure. for some of the viewers, you know, that are out there that are not the pros – that are either pro-ams they're just coming up or maybe even just a hobbyist, they need to know that you can do this kind of thing. You can edit photos. You can do all this stuff without having to go with, you know, a thousand dollar package over, sure. you know, time. Um, you can that's do right. it on the cheap, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, this, you know, your, your end result here is great. Now, us as photographers, are we going to be painting pictures? No. But what this does show is it shows that you can use the tools for your retouching that you can use the tools to create skin tones, that you can use the tools to create sharps and softnesses. Um, you know, and then obviously the cloning and, and all of the color corrections and all those other types of features are available in GIMP as well. So it, I mean, this definitely is a very, very usable, um, even at a pro level software. So, Absolutely. you know, that's why we really want to talk about it. I mean, you know, are am I going to switch to GIMP as a professional? No, I mean, I can't. I, I'm right. a Photoshop guy. I'm going to continue to use Photoshop because that's what I need for my business. Right. Um, but GIMP outputs JPEG files, you sure. know, which are really all you need to send to the printer. You know, exactly. you don't need any exactly. type of special, you know, Photoshop only formats here, you know. So, right. again, you know, it is a very usable program for this for your work. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, it's on the cheap. You can you can get fantastic results as far as editing like you're saying a photo that's like a no-brainer yep. and that was the whole reason why i wanted to do the painting because um you know it's a lot more complicated very very detailed yeah, very you know yeah, yeah. you're dealing with lights and darks and shadows yep. you know the whole the whole gamut um so editing a photo is you know you could do it in your sleep in the yeah, or, or any of these absolutely so you know, and if anyone, you know, so I did this and I, I like doing things like this and having these little side projects. And we've talked about this in the past. It kind of gets your mind kind of moving a little bit differently. It gets you to understand lights and darks and tones and how light hits the face and how li right. light hits structures and whatnot. And I really do think that when you start, you know, maybe doing a little bit of painting or editing in this type of manner, you end up getting better as a photographer because you see light a little bit yes. different or a little bit better. So, you know, I, I would suggest it. You know, if you guys don't have a tablet and you're a photographer, you need to buy one yesterday. Um, that's number one. Number two, do some drawings, do some painting, get some reference material, play around. Yeah, shoot your own or, reference material. Yeah, shoot your own reference material. And maybe material. you don't start with a portrait. I mean, if you're not a painter, if right. you don't have those types of skills or that background, start with just some simple still life. I mean, that's what every art school does. I mean, that's what I went right. through. Portraits are definitely not my thing. I, you know, it really takes a certain um, knack and a certain skill set to be able to do portraits that look really good, that are accurate. Right. And uh, that, that just wasn't my thing. I did... When I was in art school, I mean, I did portraits and stuff because that was part of the classes I took. And and they looked good. They looked like people, but they didn't <laughs> right. look exactly like the model or the subject. I know I did this one of Harrison Ford as uh, Indiana Jones as one of my school projects. And, right. and you looked at it and, it and it looked like him. I mean, there was no doubt who it was, but it was just there was always something that bugged me about it. It was always just something a little bit off. A something lot of people off. never even saw it, but I did. And uh, that's why yeah, I'm like, we're you always hyper, we're hypercritical with our own yeah. work. It doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, I think as artists, that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. We're, we, you know, we're always like that. We're a little bit more, you know, 
as centric. I think it would be right. Yeah, <laughs> but look kind of, yeah. It's just the way it 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 always is. And we look at our work and we look at all of the things that we could have done better with it, whereas someone sure. else just wouldn't even see it. So yeah, but you know, it'd be it would definitely be something that you guys can give it give a shot. You know, do some painting, do some do some light stuff, do play with light, play with color. Um, and when you start doing that within a palette, or you know, I used to do oil painting a lot, and um, you know, when you start mixing those colors together and just seeing how things play and, you know, it, it gives you a different idea on how to set up shots. Yep. Um, not just, not necessarily just the lights and darks, but also how color play together. And that's, I think, you know, the second tier of photography, you know, it's first right. being able to get those, you know, lights and darks, right. Seeing in white and black. Um, after that, it's seeing how the colors start playing together and then getting them to work. Um, right. Right. And that that's a whole nother level completely. So, well, but anyways, is, this is where I always go back to, you know, where I always recommend a formal art education, even in right. photography, um, if you can afford to do so. Um, yeah. You learn so much in art school that is not specific to photography, but is is art. You know, it, it teaches you how to see. It teaches you how to think. It teaches you how to compose. You learn about colors and lights and darks and all that stuff that, you know, sometimes you just don't get out of a book. Um, now that's not to say that you can't be self-taught and be a very good photographer because there are many of them out there. Um, me personally, I like the idea of having a traditional art background though. Yeah, no, it, it I definitely helps for sure. It yep. definitely helps. So, you know, talking about photos and sharing photos and whatnot, Facebook now, right, has rolled out photo comments. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. So we'll take a little detour here. Now we'll hit the business yeah. side, the social media side. We'll leap from the creative side. And uh, yeah, so this is pretty interesting. Um, I, I really, I like this a lot. So they're rolling this out. So not everybody has it yet. But right. um, on your status updates and, and uh, on both your profiles and your pages, um, they are rolling out the ability for you to actually attach a comment or, or attach a photo into right. a comment, right. which is really neat. So with your normal status, you know, your comment box um, to the far right of it would be a little icon of a camera. You can click that and actually select a photo from your computer, not necessarily your Facebook photo library or something like that. Right. Whereas so before it, it used to be just a link, right? Yeah, well, that's it. The only way you could share a photo in a comment is you'd have to put a link into it. And then right. Facebook would actually pull in like a, a small thumbnail of the photo. Um, yeah. which was fine. I mean, that worked, but what's really nice about this is it actually pulls it in big. So it's no, it's not a little thumbnail. You can actually see the detail in the photo. You can see, you know, it's definitely, it really is a lot more impactful. It makes your comment box much larger. Yeah. So, so it, it makes it more of a one-step process. You know, before mm -hmm. you'd have to go and host your photos somewhere, right. And then go and link right. to them Yep. Um, from wherever they are, you know, now it's just dragging them right into Facebook and they're hosting the photo and it's at right. whatever quality or, or size that you're sending them at. So I'm sure they're doing some interpolation or some, you know, compression, obviously. Yeah. Um, and there's probably, a, you know, a maximum. I'm not sure what that is, but still, at least you're able to drag it and drop it in there in comparison to having to do this two step process. So I like it. It's cool. And it's clickable. So right. in the comment, the, a viewer can actually click on your photo and it will open it up in a light box view larger on screen so people can really see the detail um really neat i i like it um you know so how is this beneficial um there's i see a couple different um ways to use it so for example if you're an event photographer on your facebook page you could post um you know a gallery a few photos or what have you of an event and then invite the the guests to share their photos Right. You know, it gets them to interact with your page. Again, you know, we're not necessarily out here on Facebook sharing photos to specifically sell the images, to sell that particular photograph. Right. We're on Facebook to build our brand, right. to get our name out there, to build exposure for us to as many people as we can and as many relevant people as we can. So if you just did an event for somebody and there was an attendee there, um, odds are pretty good that they would be a, a good possible client in the future. So inviting them over to your page to share your photos that you created with your smartphone or your, your point and shoot or what have you um, on the page is a great way. First off, before they can do it, they have to like your page. That's just the way it is. So now you get a new fan. 
Now you get a relevant fan. You have a connection with them already. Um, now they share the photo on the page that goes out through their news stream and it's all connected to you and your page. Yeah. And it's per, and, you know, and the idea of sharing something from an event that just happened, it's very timely. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, you yes. know, it just happened and it's with a crew or the crowd that's looking at it is that really care. And yes. since they care, the chances of them to, you know, of sharing it with their community is great. Yes. So you're more likely to have a photo you know, shared than some, you know, you know, comment that you put in there. Oh, you know, we loved working over at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago this week, blah, blah, right, blah. Right. But now if I send a photo of um, Trump with, uh, you know, with the hairstylist or something, you know, you know, that hairstylist is going to, you know, send that to all of her friends and, sure. uh, you know, it's going to be, you know, well received. So yeah, photos, just simply work and you know now that they're doing this the way the way it is and they're making it easier you know this whole quote-unquote one step instead of multi-step is fantastic and then the side to that is video video is even more powerful right yeah so, and it just got even uh even better now right. because just this week uh so we're recording friday so yesterday thursday by the time you guys hear this this will be on monday um facebook announced video for instagram right which is huge huge yeah. um this i mean instagram is a huge compute uh community they've got like 130 million users or some crazy exactly. thing like that they're part of facebook so it makes instagram and facebook integration very easy um right. and it it allows you to shoot like 15 second clips yeah, and um, you know what? I just, you know, the time is perfect. 15 seconds is more than enough, yeah. number one. But what's really cool is they give you all of those filters, you know, all those great filters yep. that they that you get through, you know, your standard photo portion of Instagram. But now you can go and put these filters onto your video, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Fun. So you can give it, you know, some, you know, some cool uh, techniques and stuff like that. Um, you know, Twitter's competitor, basically, Vine, um, you know, is, is good. It's similar. I've played with that as well. Um, the issue that I have with it is it's a six second clip. It's really hard to do much of anything in six seconds. Right. Um, 15 seconds is decent. I mean, that's, that's a good, a, that's yeah, a short a good TV amount. commercial. That's right. You know, I mean, you can actually do something with that. Um, what's really nice is they have a stabilization right. feature built into this app called cinema. And by default, it's turned on. So if you're walking around, if you're walking outside, um, they've got a couple great examples on the website that you'll see if you're watching the video. Um, you know, they're following like a little kid and the kid's running and they're running after them. Yeah, the you can tell that they're shaky. actually walking fast or running after. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. And then with this stabilization on, it just smooths it all out. It looks almost like it's on a steady cam. You know, right. it's it's really, really neat. So it's this amazing. is going to be the software huge. processing now, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be huge. And I would say with the size of Facebook's community, the size of Instagram's community, um, the fact that Instagram, the video portion has greater capabilities, in my opinion, than Vine does. Um, I would think that Vine is really going to have to step up their game. You know, Twitter, Twitter bought Vine. Vine, they're going to have to really step up the game with Vine. But I think at this point, they're going to be playing catch up. I don't think they're going to be the dominant video, um, you know, short video. Uh, yeah, app, I think it's I think say. it's just I think it's funny how these large companies, they either buy out the smaller ones or what they'll do is they'll just create a product to just be a direct competitor of that specific product. And um, and that's it. That's, you know. It's almost, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that originally creates something usually does well and ends up bought out or <laughs> these huge that's corporations right. will make something that's very similar. I yeah. tell you what, you know, Facebook hits, what is it? One billion monthly active users. That's fantastic. And then they also hit one million active advertisers. Now that's good, you know, because now if you do, you know, one of these little promoted pieces or you do, um, you know, share the videos and you do the sharing and maybe you even use the ads in there, yep. you know that you're hitting a very large, large daily community uh, of people out there. So, yeah. you know, who knows, you know, for business, it might start making a little bit more sense than before. I know we, you know, we were kind of downplaying Facebook, you know, ads and ad placements and whatnot um, a little bit in, you know, past shows. But maybe this is going to kind of help that out a little bit and make it actually, quote unquote, worth using Facebook 
um, you know, for communicating with possible, yeah. you know, new business. Yeah, I mean, the Facebook ads themselves, um, you know, the traditional Facebook ad that appears in the right-hand sidebar, um, I've had lukewarm results with that. I know a lot of people are doing very well with it, um, but they're also spending a lot of money to do it. Right. Um, what I have found with firsthand experience is that promoted posts work really well. Um, if you have something important that you want to get out there and you want to get it out to your existing community and friends of the people who like your page, um, promoted posts work great. I mean, that really expands your viewership. Um, I've done several tests just to see how it works and then have used them for actual client purposes. And uh, we've gotten great results with it. Lots of comments, lots of likes and shares. So again, you know, you post one of these Instagram videos that is pretty cool. Maybe it's a behind the scenes of one of your event shoots. Um, maybe it's in conjunction with uh, some photos from an event that you're posting up there. Um, it has a cool kind of gritty feel to it. You know, it's that shareable right, right. content. People, you know, I, people like I it. tell you what, Trevor, you know how we always say, you know, if you're going to post any of this data onto Twitter or whatnot, you always hashtag, hashtag everything, right? Yep. You throw yep. hashtags on stuff because people are actually searching for these hashtags and programs out there are actually combing for these hashtags yes. so that your information comes up more toward the top or in the group that you want it to be. So maybe hashtag photography or maybe it's your venue, like I was saying, Mar-a-Lago. So maybe it's hashtag Mar-a-Lago. Right. or whatnot right now finally which is you know kind of interesting facebook officially supports hashtagging so they're basically twitter now twitter-esque with yes. hashtags so now when you're making these hashtags you know that you can actually use similar type of hashtagging on both facebook and twitter so that's yeah. really cool that's great right? this is huge i mean the hashtags that we're used to using on twitter we have photography of course you know right. pound photography we have pound photogs Right. We have pound photo. Um, we have a lot of these different um, common hashtags that we're already using. Well, now you can tag your posts and you know your updates and things like that with these hashtags, and they're actually officially supported. So if you tag a photo with you know pound photography, you know now there's going to be people gaming the system. They're going to be people sure. putting up status updates with a ton of hashtags in them. I've seen it already, and it's a big right. mess. If you do it properly, people will respect you more. So just yeah. keep that yeah, in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, just like in in Twitter, you know, put you put more than three hashtags in one of those hundred and forty no. um, <laughs> character comments, and it. people get upset. Three is like the limit. Yeah. You start doing four, five, six hashtags, and now all of a sudden, people are just turned off. You know, yeah, to it. exactly. It's like the the whole idea of ad blindness. Yeah, that immediately sets in. So yeah, be careful if you if you're hashtagging something, Facebook brand new now, whatever. Do it thoughtfully, um, you know, and, uh, you know, do it, do it right. Don't, don't yeah. get nuts with it. Exactly. But yeah, it is searchable. So Facebook yep. will be searching um, for these hashtags as Google has forever already. Um, you know, hashtagging is big. It's, it's, it's big and it's a smart thing to do for your SEO um, to keep your things that you're saying top of mind or at least towards the top of a specific category that you want to stay in or you want yes. your, your comment to be seen by people that are actually interested in X, whatever it is. So yes, that, that's right. End. That's right. right. So now what Now what you can do is you can actually go to your search box at the top of your Facebook page. You can type in the, the pound symbol, the hash symbol, with whatever the term is, and it will show conversations, public-facing conversations um, around that hashtag. So that's right. great. And you know there are people out there putting in the search term photography. Sure. or fo photos or what have you. I mean, even more specific, think about it. Think about your hashtags um, when you're doing your posts, how how they're related. I mean, right. for Joe, I mean, for you and I, pound podcast, you know? Right. I mean, we'll, we'll, we're definitely gonna start utilizing these hashtags on Facebook more, but... So the interesting thing about the way these work, though, is they are based on your privacy setting. Right, public, friends, or, or et cetera. Right. Right. So if you have all your status updates set to be friends only, only your friends who search for that hashtag will actually see it. Right. Which can kind of be pointless, you know, unless yeah, you've then got it's very limited friends, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's not gonna be it's not really gonna help a whole lot. So really what you wanna do is certain posts you wanna make public and available to anyone. 
Absolutely. And by doing that, then you put those hashtags in it and then they'll be able to be seen by anyone searching those those terms. Um, I would recommend doing it more from your Facebook page rather than your personal profile because now you're directing. Right. If you want to keep your personal profile personal, do the hashtagging from your page. Right. Um, or or just keep all your posts locked down and have it to the hashtag. Yeah, just I mean, some photographers use their personal page um, as their means of communication with past clients. And, mm -hmm. you know, that is one way of doing it. And at that point, you know, it wouldn't be bad. You know, you have 5,000 past clients, let's say, um, on your personal page and you do a hashtag about some type of special or maybe you're doing a get together or thank you to those clients and you're hashing some type of event or, you know, then, then it makes sense. But yes, if you're doing something more general or let's say you're a wedding photographer and you want, you know, people that are brides that want, you know, brides to see your stuff, then you might want to do a hashtag weddings or hashtag bridal something or whatnot and do it as a public facing um, post or right. comment. So right. yeah, exactly. absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. But it's good. It's, it's great that it's they cool. went down this road and, um, you know, it's, it's basically the idea of more of the same. They're following something that simply works, yeah. right? Um, they're following Twitter. They know Twitter works. You know, they, they, they know that this is functioning properly and people use it all the time. They see it on TV all the time. They're seeing, you know, pound this, pound that through major, mm -hmm. major, yep. uh, right on the, the, the networks. Yeah. absolutely yeah <laughs> exactly just got so done that with point, that whole thing right that's right that's right so you know it's kind of it would be foolish if they didn't you know bring that on yeah. board as an officially you know supported item so yep. to speak yep. so anyways moving forward um mirrorless cameras i know we've talked about them in the past on a regular basis i've always you know i've said oh god i need i need something lightweight for doing my you know event work business stuff is just so heavy right. and samsung just came out with or is coming with the galaxy nx right very yeah. very cool camera. this is really cool this is one of these hot announcements that just came out um this week i mean it'll yeah. be thursday um you guys will be hearing this on monday um right. this just came out and uh, this is pretty. This is pretty hot. Um, we so talked about something like this, right? Like uh, probably I don't know, even know maybe ten shows or yeah, fifteen shows about know. this. We were talking about cameras that are basically computers um, that run Android, and yeah. all of the possibilities of having such a device. And here we go. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I mean, there we there talked. I know on a past show we talked about a Samsung had a point and shoot camera. Um, no interchangeable lenses or anything that basically was an Android phone, but, you know, looked like a camera minus the phone. It had 3G and 4G uh, connectivity, which is great. Um, so does this one. Right. But this is actually an interchangeable lens. So it looks almost like a DSLR with interchangeable lenses. It has an electronic uh, viewfinder. So you can stick your grill right up to it and look into exactly. it. Um, but it has a um, a huge... Yes. 4.8 inch LCD screen on the back of it. Huge is an understatement. Yeah. Almost yeah. five inch. Just think about this guys. I mean, it's like taking a, the S4, like a Samsung S4 and yeah. strap it onto the back of a DSLR. Yeah. It is beautiful. And we know Samsung just gets it right when it comes to, you know, LCDs and it just looks absolutely beautiful. It doesn't have a tilt on it. Okay. No. Which I, I would, you know, if you can, if Samsung's yeah. listening, a couple iterations think about down that. the road, though, it probably Maybe. will. Maybe, um, but oh my God! I mean, this thing is just huge. It is beautiful, really yeah. nice. It's running um, Jelly Bean, which is yep. Android, Android four point two. Awesome, full HD, ten eighty p, which is fantastic. Wi Fi, um, you know, uh, Wi Fi connectivity, obviously, and yep. of course, like you were saying before, three G, four G, you know, LTE, um, and but, it's twenty point three <laughs> megapixel. APS-C right. SEMA sensor. So it's a big sensor in this thing. It's not a little point and shoot sensor. So just think about this sensor being the equivalent to like a 7D, yeah. you know, a Canon 7D or something yeah. like that, APS-C um, SEMA. So you're, yeah, that is a it's big. It's got the resolution. I mean, the quality of the sensor, I mean, we don't know, we um, don't know of right. course, but, you know, nowadays the modern sensors are very good. Um, yeah, I'm they're sure very, you're gonna be able they're very similar. And what ends up happening, yeah. Trevor, is the software that runs behind it that does yes. that interpolation 
is really what you're paying for these days. I mean, the sensors are very, very similar unless you go with, you know, something that's completely, but a CMOS is pretty much a CMOS is a CMOS. It's yeah. just how it's being interpolated. So, you and, know, you know those, and now we're looking at well, the processing, right? So, you know, our DSLR cameras, they have a, a certain amount of computing power in let's them. Let's just call it crap computing power. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, it's horrid. Well, this baby has a 1.6 gigahertz quad core processor. <laughs> I mean, this is like computer, yeah. you know, yes. I mean, this isn't, you know, something shabby like what's built in to, to, you know, to our DSLRs. I mean, it's got uh, 16 gigabytes of, you know, flash storage basically built into it. And you can add a micro SD up to right. uh, 64 gigs for expandability. So that's great. Right. I mean, you can put a lot of uh, photos on that and it's got two gigs of RAM. Right. I mean, it's, that's not so it's, bad either. Yeah, so it's got the built-in, obviously, because it's a computer, Trev, right? Yep. It's like a full-blown computer is yep. what it is. So, you know, you think about this. I see this as the Star Trek communicator device yeah. down the road, you know? It's yeah, your yeah. camera, but it's not really a phone. But, you know, you wave it over, you know, your friend that's on the floor, the floor that just broke his femur, and it's like, yeah, his femur's broke. <laughs> you know, something. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, I, I you know, I foresee... Just by, you know, last week or the week before we were talking about, you know, advertising and how things are shared and community um, sharing of advertising and all of this stuff and basically brand awareness and how people perceive brands. And Samsung is up here, you know, compared yeah. to Apple, which is way down here at this point. At they're this point, really, yep. They're really doing it well. They're doing it right. Their UI is 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 really nice and they are being innovative yep. and not just iterating on old past products so you know this is this is just cool this is just absolutely cool i mean a quad core in a camera so what this means is guys you know you'll be able to i see the ability to download apps for this camera and these apps sure. will do all kinds of things so just think about let's say hdr you know you have these the hdi the hdr guys out there running all of the software right. now imagine if that hdr software is actually running on the camera itself at time that's, of capture yeah, and software that's optimized for the camera itself not software absolutely. necessarily for a camera phone absolutely um, and you would yeah. actually be able to since it has quad core see this hdr image through the back of that camera before yep. capture just yep. think about that imagine yeah. that so you know that's just that's just touching this a little tip i mean uh, is this the, camera the 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 future i mean i definitely think it's going down that road i definitely yeah. think that this type of technology incorporating it into high-end cameras um with beautiful optics and great capabilities I definitely think that that this is where we're ultimately going to end up. Yeah, we've um, we've made that statement from the very beginning yep. when mirrorless came out. We said this will definitely be what we'll all have in our hands as pros down the sure. road. I stand by that. I do believe that. I think we're we are spot on when it comes to that. Yep. Um, but yeah, this where you have this just excessive computer power um, in a camera just opens up the doors to so many possibilities and being that it is an android device and not proprietary quote unquote there'll right. be people that are in the industry that will be able to write software apps let's call them apps for the camera to do all just a myriad of different yep. things that that the canon and nikon are going to be sitting there just like what do we do now this is not right you know it's just right. not going to happen so they they have something here. They do. We yeah, they have, do. obviously we haven't tested it. We have not a clue. No, I you mean know, it's it's even it's the price and the delivery date are are not yeah, even determined. To be yet, announced, so. obviously, yeah. But I'm definitely going to contact our uh, our uh, PR agent over there and uh, see if we can get our hands on one. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And um, you know, once once we do, we'll test it out. We'll you know, yeah, we'll give you guys some back end results and what we find. I just. I, Definitely, this is the future, and I'm excited about it. I think it is. I think it's great. I, I I think that you know, as of you know, the last five years, I think you know, we've been stifled on in the photographic. Let's say with cameras it, it themselves. I mean, cameras were always been the same for years and years and years. That's fine. But once you move into digital realm, you really need to make you know large innovative things to the right. cameras to really sell them. And what has happened is the cameras companies have been doing the more of the same, 
mental and if you look at any camera company i don't care who it is it could be sony it could be you know uh, the canon line the the nikon whoever you will see just a barrage you know a myriad of camera numbers on and on and on, especially on the point and shoot side just on and on and on and you know hundreds of cameras of yep. these just simple simple just little slight you know iterations and now just launching out a new model this right here i think would be groundbreaking where it is a quote unquote innovation and it will take everything to a new level. So I'm, um, yeah, I think we're both really excited about this. I think it's great. Yeah. So, anyways, so. moving uh, moving forward, you know, uh, this kind of kind of to end. Um, you know, we you know we sometimes we're reading articles here, there, and elsewhere. And one thing that we found that, um, or I found this week at least, that was kind of interesting to me was Scott Bourne wrote an article, and it kind of talks about what we were just talking about. Does your camera define you? And I, I would kind of add to that, does your software define you, define you right? Sure. As we were talking about with, with uh, Photoshop and whatnot. Yep. And, you know, it was very interesting. And he was making this statement or this, you know, kind of blanket, blanket, blanket comment saying, you know, you know, I read the forms all the time. And, you know, you have one guy saying, oh, you know, I'm, you know, my Canon is better than your Nikon. Yeah, my Nikon yeah, yeah, yeah. is better than your, and then they'll even get even worse. You know, the Nikon camp would be like, you know, my D six hundred is better than your D seventy one hundred. It's the whole Mac and, or PC thing, right? And, right. It's just crazy. And what he's saying is, you know, it's funny. The people that say this, if you go and look at their work, you'll notice that their work is worse than the guys that aren't saying anything. You know, right. mine. You know, mine's better. Yours, but this whole thing. And um, you know, we know that you know, following you know him for quite some time. You know, we've been in the industry for a long period of time covering events and on and on and on. We know that he's been around forever. And seeing that he has actually gone from Nikon to Canon, from Canon to Nikon, back and forth, you know, selling everything, then buying new and then selling that and buying the, um, you know, he actually said in this article, you know, hey, I'm now my camera of choice. He's using now the Olympus, the EM5 and the Fuji 100 line, which yep. is the little... <laughs> you know, these little cameras, yeah, these, the little and interchangeable not, lens, Fuji. Yep. Right. And that I thought was very, very interesting. So, you know, I mean, you know, talking about this a little bit, I look at it as, you know, you know, we talk about gear all the time and the bottom line is, is this really not about the gear? You know, he made a very interesting statement saying, Hey, you know, during my years, I've never had an art director or, you know, someone that's purchasing stock or, or whatnot say, hey, you know, what camera did you use or what flash or what, you know, what ISO, what they don't ask that. They just right. want to see the finished product and they want to they look at it and they say, I want to buy it. That's simply it. Do you want to buy it or not? Right. And it really right. doesn't matter. Some of he was saying some of his best work that gets the most sharing is done with like a 10 D or something, you know, like way back. Um, you know, the original um, D's of the, the Canon line. So right. it really doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be this, you know, great, wonderful, brand new, you know, um, shiny object to go and take the pictures because we really are the ones that create great images or don't. Right. Um, well, I agree. To, I agree with that to an extent. Um, and the problem when, is, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, when you're talking about fine art, um, selling stock images or whatever. You're selling the final image. Um, right. I agree. It doesn't really matter what tool you create it with, um, you know, especially even if it's heavily Photoshopped or what have you. It doesn't really matter. If it if it strikes the person who's buying it, if, if they really like it and that makes them want to buy it, then success. It doesn't matter how you created it. Exactly. But when you're an event photographer, you're shooting weddings or you're shooting... Um, you know, high end galas like what you do, right. you know, if you were to come in with a tiny little camera, you know, and a tiny little flash off to the side or what, what have you, or even camera mounted, um, there is a certain perception of you at that point as a photographer. Right. Now, I mean, we've, and we've talked about this in the past too, you know, always saying the tool doesn't matter what camera you use. Um, and to an extent that that's true. But if you come in and you, you're using this small gear, um, there is a perception that you're using inferior equipment. Exactly. Um, because it's not the big professional looking buttons all over the place, big L bracket with a flash on top, you know, because it looks smaller, it looks more compact. Now, it very well may be able to deliver the same quality image. Right. But to the layperson looking at you, who potentially could hire you 
in the future to shoot their wedding or to shoot their event, if they feel that perhaps maybe you're not a professional because you came with amateur looking equipment, um, they may be less likely to hire you or to contact you. Now exactly. that may change when they see the final images, right? I mean, exactly. they may look beautiful and say, oh, wow, it's amazing that this person was able to get these, these beautiful looking images from that little tiny camera they are using. But you know, but that it's, it is about perception as much right. as it so you're, shouldn't you're shooting. Be. Absolutely. So you're shooting two ways and that happens exactly with me all the time. Yep. I always say, you know, I would love to have, you know, one of the smaller cameras, but you're shooting for two people. You're shooting for the, you know, two outputs. You're shooting for the final output and you're shooting for the output of what you look like. You know, what, yes. what do you look like as a pro pro photographer? And when you go to a, an event and you have 500 people around, you're taking photos and you're using a little small camera, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to be like, oh, my name is so-and-so because they think that you're maybe for press or something and you're just going to use it in the newspaper. Sure. But if you're in there with a big, you know, DSLR on a bracket, you know, lighting, maybe you have a secondary light on a on a pole or on a stand right. that you have an assistant holding. Now, all of a sudden, you're the pro guy. You're the pro photographer. Yes, the perception so that changes. that perception is critical for getting new business and for retaining current business. Right. Um, because they do not see the final pictures until the end of the entire gala or the event or whatnot. That's right. Um, this really, you know, plays a role, like we're saying, in events or whenever you're taking a photo that is, let's say, not studio-based. Because we know in a studio, there's many studios out there that use little tiny cameras on the back of, you know, big monster lenses on these huge brackets. And now all of a sudden, it's still studio you have studio lighting you have wireless the whole thing is sure. set up the perception is pro no matter what cameras on the back of that huge lens but right. when you're in the field that perception goes into the tube really quickly if That's you're right. holding up you know a smaller type of profile camera like what um you know scott Bourne's talking about here like for example that olympus the em5 great camera I love it. I think it, it looks like one of my old Minolta's. I, you know, the SRTs. Um, right. I love it. I think yep. it's great. But if I brought that to an event, all of a sudden I would not be looked at in the same light no. as bringing the big monster. You know, well, it's even apparatus. like the Leica cameras, right? I mean, those right. Leica cameras are beautiful cameras. They're, you know, they deliver amazing quality images, but they're mm -hmm. small. And right. for the layperson, they're not going to know that that Leica camera you're holding and shooting with is a six thousand dollar camera. <laughs> Exactly. They're going to think it's just some small little digital thing you got at Walmart or something, you know, right. they're, they're not going to know. And that's where, you know, the education, I mean, how are we going to educate the consumer who doesn't know what it is that they're buying? Right. You know, Absolutely. it doesn't happen through osmosis. I mean, you need to, you know, you need to be that educator then, you know, you need to be the educator for your area, you know, and let them, you know, build that awareness for, for who you are, the type of work that you do. And and get rid of the the stigmatism that you know you know you have to have you know all this big huge equipment. I mean, yeah, eventually I, we'll get there. Like we were saying earlier with the Samsung right. camera, eventually we're going to get to the point where we're going to have this small box with a big LCD screen on the back of it that will make coffee for you and a huge lens on the front of it. You know that we can use to shoot high end professional stuff. But yeah. we're just not there yet. No, no. As far it'll, as it'll happen. And once that does happen, then it'll it'll kind of level the playing field. And you really won't know yeah. who's pro and who's not pro. And the perception of pro will definitely change. Yes. Um, I definitely think, guys, if you guys have a small camera and you want to do, you know, bigger events or whatnot, um, put a battery grip on it, number one. It'll look yep. more pro. Uh, number two, definitely get a bracket. That looks more pro also. And it'll also keep your lighting in one spot. It'll help yeah. you for getting consistent lighting right across too. from yeah, landscape and portrait. Very, very important. It's something to um, give thought to. But yeah, going forward, there's there's no answer to this. It's just going to be time will tell. And I, yeah. I definitely think, you know, if even if you educate the bride and say, listen, I'm going to be using this $6,000, you know, Leica or whatnot, um, that's fine. The bride will know it, but guess what? The rest of the guests won't. And they're the going to look won't. at that camera like, Oh my God, what is that? Look at my big, you know, my big camera that yeah, I look have at the here. size of my rebel. You know? Exactly. You know, <laughs> and he's got this little, little tiny thing. camera. And yeah. Exactly. They just won't get it and no. you won't get work that way. So we're still stuck in this, but yeah, I, I like the idea that, um, Scott Warren's putting across here. I agree with, uh, 70% of it and 30% I think is, for us to rebut as we have. So, yep. but anyways, regardless, we need to get out of here. We are running extra long. 
this week. There's been so much, so much information. So, so much to get through. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. all good stuff. Um, good quality stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Of course, send us your comments and questions as you know, as you know, we like to get them and answer them Absolutely. on the show. So, so Joe, uh, if people want to connect with you outside of the show, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, find me on Twitter, guys. That's at Joseph Christina, and that would be Christina without an H. Great, and you can connect with me on Twitter. It's at Trevor Current. All right, guys, we are done for another week, right? Yeah, you can get all the show notes from Sweating this episode. <laughs> I know. I'm exactly sure you right. are too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my AC is gone. So, uh, but yeah, guys, go ahead and head over to digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash one hundred and ten. And don't forget, if you enjoyed the show, please give us a five-star review in iTunes. Help spread the word through Twitter. And now you can give us a call through our new comment line by visiting digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash love. So keep your questions and comments coming, and we will see you next week. You've been watching the Digital Photography Cafe show with Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina. Be sure to subscribe to the show for free in iTunes or through RSS. You can also listen on Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and watch in HD on TiVo. Visit digitalphotographycafe.com for show notes and to connect with your hosts.